At the time of this recording, the world is in the midst of a viral pandemic. Many people are afraid. Many people are in isolation, voluntary or otherwise. Some are sick or will become sick. And indeed, some are dying. In this special series of the Guru Viking podcast, I ask my guests the questions that I believe are pressing at this time. How to work with fear, anxiety and panic. How to work with isolation. How to work with sickness and death. And how to help others who are also having those experiences. Neither I nor my guests are medical professionals. And this podcast is not medical advice. Fear, sickness and death are perennial human experiences. And it's my hope that these episodes will be of use not only to those who are being affected now by this situation, but also of use to others beyond it. So Damarato, thank you for joining me for this very special series of podcasts. Many people are worried and experiencing fear or even panic. What would you say to someone who came to you and said, Damarato, I'm afraid or I'm panicking? I don't know of anyone who does come to me without saying that. That it looks like that everybody's in a state of panic, only now they're more acutely aware of it. That now they've got a reason or, or something to sort of pinpoint it to. They can, they've got a name for it now. But many people were in a state of panic before they ever heard of Corona-19. And so now they're just taking the panic, building it up to where it's almost throat-wrenching, putting a name on it, and basically like a two-year-old telling daddy, look what I've done. (laughs) So that's kind of the humorous way of looking at it, that yes, in fact, all of that is created in one's own mind. And that um, there's a lot of wisdom going on. It's leaking out sometimes in spite of Donald Trump. It's getting out. People are figuring out what's real about it, what's not real, looking at what the dangers are, and they're acting wisely. One of the ways that it might not be good for the economy, but it's really good for everyone to take a week off or two weeks off just an excuse to take a couple of weeks off and let the whole economy just shut down for a while is a really good thing. We don't even need coronavirus as an excuse to do it, but that's where we were. That's how we are. It would be so in that regard, the first thing that people should do is actually take the two weeks off. Really. (laughs) Including taking two weeks off from our worries and our anxieties. And get away from it all, literally. Get away from not only the physical possibility of catching the, the virus itself, but take, away, take ourselves away from thinking about it. That we don't spend any time with it. That it's worth researching and looking into so that we know that we're doing the right thing. And then after that, it, let's, let's not keep trying to figure out what we need to do. Let's now instead begin to left to look at the residual anxiety that was there in the first place, because we now know to the best of our ability with our frontal cortex fully in operation that we wisely see that I've taken all the precautions necessary so that I'm not going to catch the virus. Now let's deal with the anxiety that was associated with it because it's not the coronavirus anymore. Now, it's the way we feel. So, that's another part of then the seclusion that we were talking about earlier, that seclusion in regard of because there's an epidemic, let's everybody take two weeks off and stay in seclusion so that they're not around other people. Keep your distance, keep your contact minimal, And start spending your time alone. That's really, really good advice. It's exactly what the monks did in the time of the Buddha. All right? So, uh, everybody, let's have a couple of weeks of Buddha. (laughs) No contact. Just stay away from everybody else and stop thinking about all of their trouble. 
so that we can clean our own mind out and begin to deal with the anxiety that we haven't been dealing with because there's no reason for anyone to have ever heard anything about coronavirus and then left it to their feelings. No, they should investigate, find out what's going on, recognize there is no danger there, and then stop dealing with it as if there were danger. I think one example of that is like the dog. Because my, the student that was asking me about this today had a dog there. And so I says, imagine that the dog thinks that there is something amiss. Maybe a stranger is outside or that some big noise happens down the street and the dog is bark, 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 bark. And that uh, the human then goes to the window, takes a look and sees what's going on, recognizes the event and knows now that the dog has no reason to have freaked out. But you can see why he freaked out. Okay, that this was a false positive. Okay. So, now what do we do with the dog? Well, one of the things, if we're compassionate, is we can say, down boy, it's okay. Everything is okay. Pet him or, or whatever. Down boy, all right? So, now if we understand that the very part of the mind that the dog used to get upset about whatever it was that happened... That's that same part of the brain that we use when we get upset. And so with our wisdom, the way that we would work with the dog uh, when we're acting human, now we need to start acting human with our own self in the sense of working with our feelings the way that we would work with a dog that's upset for no reason at all. Down, boy. Okay, just settle down. Okay, so when that anxiety comes up, we can see it but we're going to take control of it rather than it having us by the throat. It's literally, we've turned it into a pet that is not running our lives anymore. But most people, because we're on kind of an automatic pilot or live our lives in um, uh, instinctual way, that we give, we give too much credit to that self-preservation instinct. So that that self-preservation instinct pops into gear, fires up, and roars to life, sometimes on false pretenses. And this is one of them. The reason that people are upset is not because of the coronavirus itself. They're upset because they have the natural tendency to get upset. And they'll find some trigger or some reason for it. And then they become upset. Now, a good meditator, when he becomes upset, he's going to say, aha, I see that upsetness now. Let me check to make sure that everything is okay. Let me do the research I need to do, if it's about coronavirus or whatever. And then we know what we need to know. And we do what we need to do to protect ourselves, and if that's if it's needed for you to get a, a full-blown zoot suit that looks something like a, a, an antivirus version of a uh, beekeeper's costume, but whatever it is that you need to get together so that you feel safe after you get it that far so that you now have all of the stuff that you need to feel safe, go ahead and feel safe. <laughs> And that's the secret that it takes. You find out whatever it is for you that's going to give you the satisfaction that you've done what you need to do to protect yourself. And now let that be the winner of your heart so that you feel now very secure rather than uh, nerves so that you don't call a teacher and say, oh, I stopped practicing meditation because I was so nervous. Oh, no, you're actually practicing meditation when you actually see the nervousness. That's practice. Congratulations for practicing. Well, you can see this nervousness. So it's, a, it's a, possibly a, a way is to think of it as an attitudinal change. Everything is about the attitude. 
Is there a practice you'd recommend or a practice strategy that you'd recommend to turn the mind from fear to a different sort of emotion? You've already discussed there this idea of talking to that part of the body like you'd soothe a dog who is agitated by somebody walking past the front door. I mean, that sounds like, mm-hmm. that's a, that sounds like a meditation technique to me. Would that be the uh, main advice then from a technique point of view? Uh, yes, you can in fact uh, change the, the concept around a little bit and then fit it right into the practice of Anapanasati. That this is in fact part of the way uh, and that after Sati, after you wake up, Part of that investigation quality also now is gladdening the mind. So we're talking about step nine on Vanapanasati and step 10 of Vanapanasati. That's basically all we've been talking about. <laughs> but then there's other aspects of Vanapanasati that puts together a fuller practice. But basically it is if we can come to the point of seeing whatever it is, then we can gladden the mind to the point of taking control over it. In other words, it's no longer our boss. Now we become its boss. I love this example. Everybody is an emperor of their own pile of dirt. Okay? It's just true. Everybody's an emperor of their own pile of dirt. The question is, are you buried half under it? Are you completely buried under your pile of dirt? Or are you sitting happily on top of your own world? And it's all about an an attitude, and the attitude that normally people have is the kind of attitude, then, of a loser that has some reason to worry and be anxious about uh, coronavirus, even beyond the intelligence part that shows them you've already done everything that needs to be done. People uh, around the world are falling sick or may fall sick. What would you say to someone who came to you and said, Damarato, I've just been diagnosed with a sickness, or Damarato, indeed, I have fallen sick, I am sick? Okay. I would say to them, if you can get tested for coronavirus, then do. Find out for sure that it's coronavirus or not. Because most people who have the coronavirus-like symptoms don't actually have that particular strain of it. It's got of quite unique characteristics. And if you can get tested, then do so. But in all cases, stay even more so isolated. You've got a real good reason now to stay in seclusion. But now you've also got an additional item of um, mindfulness to take care of. And that is the sick body. And that it's really good to work with, to nurture, to care for, and to pay attention to this sick body, as if now that's the uh, the object of meditation. Whereas before, anxiety. Before that, it was coronavirus. I got to find out about it. Now that I know, I've taken all the precautions. I'm sick anyway. Now I got to find out, is that it or not? But being sick now gives us a new opportunity for practice with the assumption that we're going to survive this illness. We're not going to die. We're just going to lay here and be sick. And we're going to do a really excellent job of doing that. High class, noble, sick. Okay. So even if I'm in the hospital, I'm still very friendly with the nurses. You don't give them your hard time. So uh, this takes some mindfulness to really build up to the point that, uh, and this is your best opportunity. It's like being ill is a major, major useful thing to develop one's practice. Because after we get out of the sickness and we can look back and say, oh, if I can do that while I'm sick, then I can behave that way nobly, high class, all the time. There's no more excuse for it, me behaving badly according to my feelings. I want to behave high class because I know how, because I've been practicing even while I was sick. 
Okay. Now, one of the qualities of that uh, high class are, are having that we need to keep continuing with sati because the normal way of doing it is when the body is sick, the mind gets sick too. So when the mind gets sick, then it's, oh no, poor me, and all of that. So we begin to feel bad. And when I say feel bad, it's not just that the body is distressed and, and, uh, and feeling bad. It's also the feelings themselves that are bad. That we almost give ourselves a, a pity party, literally. <laughs> and so uh, sati and correct practice then is going to remind us to continue to change our attitude. That I'm on top of this illness, that I am not the body. The body is sick, but the mind is not sick. The mind is just darn tootin', thank you very much. And so we raise the mind out of that into the state of a winner. Yes, the body is sick, and I can handle it. I'll come out stronger for it. I'll use it to develop the mind. In a way, you can think of it like the um, some athletes will train with uh, big, heavy sandbags or even lead bars strapped to their wrist and strapped to their ankles just to, to work out, or even boxers will do it so that it helps them build speed. Because if they could get uh, their, their arms with these um, uh, hindrances in there, and get it up and going to full speed, then when they take these hindrances off, now we can go even faster. It's just a natural way of building things up. So we can think of illness as, okay, now I've got a new burden. I've got a new tool that I've got to work with because I, the only other choice is to feel bad, <laughs> right? So let's go ahead and practice, and we practice every time we remember to practice because the natural tendency is to go back into poor me. So by practicing correctly, including Anapanasati, which we'll get to in a moment, this actually will lessen the illness. We don't feel quite so bad. We're much more like being walking wounded than we are bedridden, just mentally. And so we pull ourselves out of it. It really is an attitude change. And this has a lot to do with how the placebo effect works. You know what I mean by placebo? Yes, the effect of the mind on the body. Right, and that in uh, medical trials with new pills and whatnot, they generally use it uh, at the level of 28%. In other words, if they have a control group and, that, and the group that they give it to, if they don't see uh, something like much better than 30%, then this drug has no value. And that in fact, they, they have found ways of driving that percentage rate quite high for placebos. And one of the ways of doing it is have the people in the trial actually crawl into a bed in a hospital with a hospital gown hooked up to all of the hospital equipment, including the drip. And then the doctor comes in and he says, I'm going to put this little stuff in there as a new trial medicine. I'm going to monitor you very closely. And he didn't put nothing in there, right? But he's fooled them now, and they're part of the placebo. And that kind of placebo goes up to about 46, 47 percent. The rest of them, uh, the rest of the mind, because the mind is divided on this. Is this real or not? Okay, we can actually use that to an advantage, because we can come to the conclusion beyond a doubt that I'm going to be okay with this illness. I'm going to survive this, and even if I don't, I'll die happily. And we can talk about that, but before we do, one of the things that can happen is, is that we can, with the coronavirus and other things, in fact, even the Spanish flu of, of uh, uh, 1918 was all about pneumonia. Now, pneumonia is not the cause of death, but it is the, the last thing that happens in the sense that the lungs get full of moisture and all kinds of other crap that's not being breathed out very well because the individual is not breathing very well, and there's a whole lot of reasons for that. One of the main things, in fact, I, can, I, I know of at least one case individually that this woman died from 
uh, pneumonia and uh, she stopped breathing simply because the doctors wouldn't take her off the morphine. They would rather make her comfortable and she stopped breathing because she didn't have, and nobody was there take, saying, Grandma, looking her in the face, waking her up and said, Grandma, take a deep breath, breathe. If your sickness gets to the point, and it doesn't even matter now if you're really, really sick to the point of death, that is coronavirus or not. That's old news. The new news is if I'm close to death, what do I need to do to live moment by moment? And again, the answer is let's go back to step one of Anapanasati. Let's make sure that the last effort that I put in in life is taking one more breath. Just one more. Keep going. Okay, so every time that we do that, if it's pneumonia for sure, then that pneumonia will, in fact, start to dissipate. One thing that we do know, and that is that the body temperature is, is higher than the air temperature in almost all cases. In the desert, not so. But that's a different story, because the same thing is different there. In the air, the air is completely empty of water. But because normally the body is a little bit warmer, that means that the that the uh, the air can absorb more moisture, and so merely by breathing and continuing to breathe, the the that air that is so saturated with the moisture and all of that fluid that's warm in the body is going to be taken back out with the breath. If we're breathing well, we will actually clean the air out of the lungs. And that um, pneumonia is one of the primary causes of death. And yet there's this whole simple issue about can you keep breathing? I mean, even when the doctors are there on the table and the guy stops breathing, they want to get the breathing going again, even if they have to pound on the chest. So we can pound on our own chest mentally in that regard. Keep going. One more breath. One more breath. And with each breath we take, we're capable of taking just one more better breath because we've already started to rid the, the deepest part of the poisons out into the air. So it actually begins uh, easier. Even if we get down to the point of I, breathing is so labored that I can only take just a few more breaths, if you count them right, they will be the generation to bring the body back to life, that we can do that. And it's all really mental, but we're doing physical things in that regard is not magic, but the mind can be that strong. And yet in the movies, you'll say um, when the guy gets shot or whatever like that, instead of his comrades saying, keep breathing, keep breathing, they say, Jimmy, don't die on me. <laughs> Hang on, hang on. Well, what is he going to hang on to? Well, in fact, he might be partially choking. So if you've got someone that's in that state, make sure that they're breathing, just like you would want to make sure that you're breathing. That would be a really compassionate thing to do, is to make sure that you've got a friend who's sick to keep him breathing. Because even if he gives you what you what he's got, You'll be able to manage it better than he could. And so we're kind of willing to take that chance to, to save one's, someone's life. So this whole idea then of getting really, really sick is, can be, be changed. And it doesn't matter whether they're old or young. The reason that the older people are dying off with uh, this virus is because uh, they lay down and just, you know, go limp and stop really breathing while the lungs are not capable of breathing well anyway. So the pneumonia winds up as the killer. So now we know what to do. But there can become a time when, in fact, pneumonia's got us. In that case, let me ask you there. What would you say to someone who came to you and said, uh, Damarato, I think I'm dying, or indeed, Damarato, I am dying? Watch closely. I would hope that it has to do with how long we have known each other as to how quickly I can cut right to the chase. But if I don't know them at all, 
then maybe over the course of a couple of weeks, I would say, call me every day, every day. We've got to lay this stuff out because, in fact, you are going to die. But basically, we have to do that with, you know, there's that old Buddhist expression, letting go. Well, we got to let go at that level, too. OK, we have to stop clinging. And that a whole quality of that has to do with whether or not the, the student can get themselves into a state of fearlessness or not. Because, in fact, the whole quality of fear is that deep programming right down into our DNA that is the survival instinct. So here the last job of the survival instinct is to stop trying to do the survival instinct when it's needed the most. This is a kind of a balance that the Buddha talks about in the, in the high fetters when he's talking about uh, Rupa Raga and a Rupa Raga. You might know something about that. Some people think that oh, it's lust for the formless in the sense of, oh, I want to have the jhanas or, oh, I want to go to heaven or something like that. But no, what it is is this, this tussle of letting go so that we can accept death and go into the formless state without either lusting for it or resisting it, but coming into a balance. And that balance is then that letting go. So in that regard, I would say when we come to that point of saying, well, one more breath, and then the answer is, no, there's not even one breath left, then I would say the next thought would be, well, how about a smile? Because that's about it. If you've stopped breathing and you can't take one more. But this, is, this takes real presence of mind. Most people are kind of freaked out. If they're going to live their lives according to their feelings, they'll probably be dying according to their feelings. Sort of in the regard of he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. So if you live by feelings, you'll probably die that way too. But if you live wisely, then you can die wisely. And a lot of it has to do with can we face death fearlessly? The answer is we need to do some practice. And one of the ways of practice is by getting sick. Getting sick is getting closer and closer to death. So that's a good time to begin practice is when we're sick. That's another benefit of uh, practicing well rather than, oh, well, I, I, I'm so sick I can't meditate right now. <laughs> no, that's the time when we actually will not only need it most, but it'll be the time when we can best hone our skills and get really sharp at it. Because who knows, it, <laughs> we may be there laying in bed sick with what we think is the coronavirus and the thief comes in the window and stabs us with a knife. Now what do we do? You know? <laughs> who knows what's going to happen? The answer is, can we handle this present moment? Because nobody knows what's going to happen. Nobody knows the future. And so there's no reason to be afraid all along the line. I don't have it, so I'm taking precautions. And then I, I do get sick, but I'm going to get out of it easily. And then I'm sick, and now I'm really sick. And I have to work at continuing to breathe to make sure that I'm breathing. And then I can get down to the point that even that's not possible. But I got at least a smile left. Okay, so all the way down the line, we have choices about how we're going to, to go out. You've written also here in our uh, correspondence before we began this interview, uh, going out in style, the fourth Jana, and dead and loving it, the Leslie Nielsen movie. <laughs> Have you touched on those points yet? Not yet. No, let's talk about the fourth Jana in the sense that uh, the fourth Jana is probably the state that is as close to death as one can get and still come back. So it's actually quite natural. It actually would be possible for someone who is not even a student of the Buddha or know, in fact, any of the things that we're talking about to go out in fourth jhana. That would be, and some people actually would prefer that, like I would rather die in my sleep. Well, 
that's basically what's happening is that their mind flashes through the poor jhana into death itself. Uh, so uh, we can understand now that the Buddha himself actually went through the sequence from the first uh, the jhana to the fourth jhana and then back from the fourth back up to the first talked to them about it, and then came back down into the fourth jhana and then died in that jhana, that's the best way to go out. So they were actually pointing out that, yes, that's the most noble way of dying. Uh, but the, the Buddha's nobility was really high class because he was conscious and capable of doing that, even though it is very evident that he did not die of an illness that had anything to do with the lungs. That it was, uh, uh, he was poisoned. Now, some people will say that he was probably intentionally poisoned, but actually, no, it took him three days to die. If someone is intentionally poisoned, they're generally going to be out pretty quick. But the Buddha took three days to die, so more than likely, he was just, uh, the whole body was collapsing in, this, in the, uh, the residue of the poison uh, that was in the food that he had eaten. Don't know any more about it than that, other than those kind of facts. But at that last time was this intentional pointing out that if we really let go, and, and, and pass, we can do that so easily to where most people really choke up in the sense that I don't want to die. And so they're clinging to that very last moment. Now, um, in some systems of belief uh, in Buddhism, that very, very last thought is an, an extraordinarily important point about how one is reborn. And so um, whether you actually believe in rebirth or not, that whole issue about that very last mind moment still does not lose its significance. That a good Dhamma dude, he should think about what's it going to be like. I'm only going to get to die once. Let me really be there for it. Let's plan on this, dude. Let's make sure that we know what's going on at that last point. And so it's actually something to look forward to. Because we can be completely fearless, not afraid of death. It's going to happen anyway, whether I'm afraid or not. My choice. So I choose to go out fearlessly. By doing so, we have complete control over that last mind moment. What is it going to be? More than likely, it will be chosen appropriately at that, at that last moment, depending upon one's state of awakening. But the final letting go from that fourth jhana is like the Mahapiri Nibbana in the sense that the Nibbana, that coolness or the final letting go is something that can only be experienced in death for anyone. And those who are prepared for death have a distinct advantage over the people who are not prepared for death. Most people, in fact, especially in, in the United States, they die by accident. Why? Well, here they are in the hospital, hooked up to all kinds of equipment. The doctor's got huge amounts of interest in keeping each individual one alive because everybody that croaks cost him a fortune. So he's interested in keeping everybody alive. And he loses on every occasion. Everybody dies. All right. So in that regard... Um, everybody dies by accident. And few of us get an opportunity for correct planning. So an example of that would be, here's Granny in the bed. It's uh, Sunday. She's about gone. Everybody knows it. The family comes in on Sunday. 
And half the women are saying, we're going to pray for your mama. We're going to pray for your grandma. And all of the boys are crying and everything like that. And then they leave. And <laughs> granny dies on Monday. And now everybody's really unhappy because they didn't have a chance to say goodbye to granny. Well, you said goodbye to granny yesterday. You just didn't take the opportunity to say goodbye. All right. So that's how they miss out. She died by accident. But I have an idea that this particular granny died the next day because that was, in fact, for her the goodbye. She had now done what she needed to do, had come to a state of grace. You've already talked a little bit in your other answers about what to do for somebody who is sick or somebody who's dying. But what would you uh, say to somebody who came to you and said, Damarato, my loved one is sick or somebody here is sick or somebody is dying? You know, what can I do? It's the coronavirus. Stay away. Or maybe not. It depends in that regard to where is this an elderly person? What is it that they have? Have you been tested, both of you? Do you know what you're talking about? So we have to actually bring some wisdom into it to figure out what's really going on. Because in most cases, it's probably not going to be the coronavirus. It's going to be the flu. But people die from the flu also. But I heard the statistics, what, 30,000 a year? All because they just don't breathe. And so that would be the issue that would get started in that is, is that how much of a control do you have to keep your friend well oxygenated? So this is one of the things that I would work with is uh, making sure that they're well ventilated. Now, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a medical doctor. Don't take my (laughs) advice for it. I'm actually what I'm doing is making suggestions for people to figure out for themselves how important breathing is. And what about from the point of view of how to support the person's state of mind when they're ill? There is, of course, how to support the body. And as you say, that's you're making some suggestions about that, but you're not a medical doctor. And that would rather depend on what the illness is. So in a sense, that's quite that's quite a different topic. But how could one best support the state of mind of someone who's sick or the state of mind of someone who's dying? I would say that you would treat the sick and dying person the way that you would treat anyone with love and care and affection and humor and joking around and making light of the situation and uh, treating them like they can get over this, that it's not an issue, that they're in charge of their own lives, that they should, that they don't have to give in to their bad feelings. And I would be, get, uh, my suggestion would, would be nonstop meditation instruction. <laughs> <laughs> then the people begin to remember to do it for themselves. Take a, break, take a deep breath, Granny. <laughs> Here, you want me to pound on your chest or you're going to do it for yourself? So that would be the way to handle that. Making sure that uh, the wisdom that, uh, that the individual Dhamma dude has been collecting is valuable and it's valuable for anyone at any time but it's especially valuable when people need it the most that's when they're sick all right then the last question many people at the moment are limiting their social contact and self-isolating either voluntarily or otherwise what advice do you have for those who have found themselves in extended seclusion enjoy Wow, what an opportunity. That's almost as good as getting locked in the isolation ward at a prison. They call it solitary confinement, you know. It's supposed to be a punishment. And an occasional Buddha walks out. (laughs) Some people really do get their mind together in there, but most of them, because they don't have the right training, go, go stark raving mad with how bad they feel. Rather than let's let's experiment and plan and figure out how good I can feel while I'm here. So that's the way to handle an extended period is use it wisely. Enjoy. Practice well. That's great. Do you have any final comments on this topic? I mean, final for this interview, at least. 
Yeah, we can say that even even if you die, enjoy that too. That's where that last line from the from the uh, Mel Brooks movie, "Dead and loving it." It is not to be feared. It's the highest peace, in fact. It's the very best there is. The monks even have a chant for that. It's part of the funeral chant. The last line of it is "Te salvu pasamo suko," which means that death is the highest peace. That death is actually the culmination of the journey of life, and so the best thing that we can do is die well, to enjoy that peace, to rest in peace, to go out in peace. But most people, when they go out, they go out in pieces. <laughs> Damarato, thank you very much. I really enjoyed this, Steve. I hope to see you again. Thank you for listening to this special edition of the Guru Viking podcast. For more information and more episodes in this series, visit www.guruviking.com.